I don't title sermons for a lot of reasons. It'd make it a whole lot easier to search them, I think. But um, I, uh, I had, this is not my notes, so here we go. This is for free. Some of that useless stuff I start sermons with sometimes. But I was really interesting this morning about how Mary was spreading the nard. And I started thinking of the phrase, shredding the gnar. Who's heard of that phrase? Oh, come on. No one skied, surfed, or skateboarded in the last 50 years. You've never heard the phrase, shredding the gnar? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's in a, it's in a New Owl City song, um, and so my kids hear it. And so I just was thinking, like, I didn't know that these were two separate words. So I thought, wouldn't it be weird if they're talking about nard? It turns out it's spelled G-N-A-R when you're shredding, right? And so I, like you do when you're ADD or squirrel-brained or whatever, uh, then you just, like, research something meaninglessly to avoid sermon prep or whatever you're supposed to be doing. And I, it turns out this phrase, uh, everyone thinks it's theirs. Skateboarders think they came up with it in the 60s, um, like uh, whatever you call like the slang term for people who ski on snow, um, whatever those people are. But they, uh, snow skiers, they think they came up with it. And NAR refers to, they've got an acronym that they think it refers to uh, with a couple of famous skiers. And then surfers, of course, think it's theirs. And I just think it's so interesting and so if we were going to title this sermon, or you see the Facebook post, I put um, Spreading the Nard in honor of Shredding the Nard, and that is useless information for you, but I hope it sticks with you. <laughs> spreading the Nard, man. Spreading the Nard. <laughs> Minimum wage. Now we'll actually start. Can we start now? Who, uh... What? Who cares if we date each other, right? I mean, some of you can look around and tell some of you are older than others, so get over it. Um, what? Uh, oh, someone's offended. I'm so sorry. Um, you're probably older. Uh, I'm just kidding. But um, what, what was minimum wage when you started working? Whoa, hold on. 75 cents? That's too low. We were supposed to start a little higher. You're too old. No. 515. Yeah, that's what I started at. What up? 215, one dollar? Yeah. So um, we'll talk about minimum wage now. Um, it's, it's a lot higher now. Uh, when I first started, uh, minimum wage was five fifty. I don't remember what I got paid at my first job when I worked at, uh, they opened Culver's in Springfield. And I was one of the first intro employees at Culver's as Culver's was coming down in Missouri from up north and Springfield got one of the first ones. But I do remember what I made at CC's Pizza, my second job. Anyone ever eaten at CC's Pizza? Boy, that place is a trough, isn't it? That's just the best. It's like, it's not a nine or 10 on the pizza scale, but it's not a four or five. It's like consistently six to seven on the pizza scale, but it's a lot. Just so much. So I worked there for five fifty an hour. That was minimum wage. We'll come back to that concept. I just think it's interesting when you think through like, man, what what was a day's work worth to you at different times in your life? And like some of you be like, man, I would never go and work what I did then for the prices now because of inflation and all that. I remember when I made $200 one day when I was in college scrapping transmissions with my uncle. And if you've ever scrapped transmissions and gone to salvage yards and picked up heavy things and whacked at them, it, it was worth $200. It was a lot of work. And I did that every day with him for a little while. Um, but that was, I, think, I think that might be the most money I remember making in a day that was like, whoa, $200 in one day for sleeping in the truck with him. And then I was just the, I was just the heavy lift. It was like, oh, go do that, Davey. And I messed stuff up. So as we did. Well, let's look in John 12 as we're thinking about minimum wage, inflation. Those things are going to come up. But let's just start going through this. I want to just, uh, you know, sometimes there's points and things. You know, I would like to just read this story. This is a pretty familiar story. Um, uh, partially because in another gospel, Jesus says, anytime the gospel's shared, this story's going to come up. So you've probably heard it preached often, or at least you're familiar with the concept of Mary washing Jesus' feet, and you're familiar with the tones of that. I had a lot of fun just Googling all the different ways this is pulled outside of Christian literature just in general. The idea of humble servanthood and how many people refer to this story um, even outside of church circles. And so, um, Um, You're probably familiar. We're just going to go through it and kind of read and unpack some of it and ultimately look at what I think John's pulling us to, thinking about Mary and thinking about Judas. Here we go. John 12, verse 1. 
Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So all of the rest of John, up till verse tw- uh, chapter 12, there's been a lot of time processed. From chapter 12, really chapter 11, on, we're talking a handful of days. And so the majority of John happens in a few days because it's a big week. It's a big, big collection of time. Uh, there's some days afterwards as well, but it's, it's a couple week time until we get to the end of John. And John wants us to be framing all these things in the Passover. This was mentioned last week. This was mentioned the week before. It's a big deal to frame your mind in Passover. John wants you to know, hey, in some ways this points to Passover. That's, that's what John wants us to know. So they gave a dinner for Jesus there. Verse 2. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. This is uh, their home of Mary, Lazarus, uh, Martha. And they're throwing a party for Jesus because he just raised Lazarus from the dead. And that's a really big deal because they were sad. I don't know if you've ever been somewhere. I've been to a lot of funerals and you see someone dead and you're convinced they're dead. And then four days later, that person is with you. So you would want to throw a party. You'd want to celebrate. And also, you definitely want to celebrate the means or the way in which that person miraculously came to life because that never happened. We don't have... Some of you might have stories of like, yeah, I mean, I was dead on the operating table for 22 minutes or whatever. That's fine. Four days. Homie was dead. Now he's alive. So we're throwing a party, particularly in the honor of Jesus. And it's interesting they all have roles. And you can read other gospels to kind of unpack this. But Martha's role was to thank Jesus by seeing to the details of the dinner. She was serving, doing stuffs. Lazarus' role was to be alive. He was alive and living and reclining with Jesus. He was just there. Like his very presence was like, wow, that guy's reclining with Jesus and, and completely loving Jesus. Why? Because he's alive. Right? And Mary's role, as we'll see, was pouring an expensive ointment on Jesus to celebrate him. So all these ways they're expressing their wonder, their joy at who Jesus is, his greatness, his awesomeness. Verse 3, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard. Say nard. Nard is a word that's really hard not to like get a little northern with, like nard. It's nard, man. Maybe that's just me. I've been doing that all week in my head. Ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her. Whoa. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. What an interesting note for him to include. It, it would seem kind of obvious, but John just wants us to know, hey, by the way, everyone could smell it. It was, it was a multi-sensory thingy that people were smelling and seeing. It was everywhere. The house was filled. So this says it was a pound. This is a Roman pound, which is about 11 ounces, right? And so think of a can of, of soda. Looks something like this. That, this is not a can of soda. This is a can of fake, fizzly junk that some of you drink. But uh, I thought I'd put it up here just to express my disdain one more time. About once a year, I need to let you all know how awful this stuff is. But think of this. So a can of really expensive, thick, oily soda. That's what she's doing. She's pouring this on Jesus' feet. What is nard? This is not a college class, and it's not a history class, but some of you really get geeked out and interested in this stuff, so you can know. This is what Nard looks like in the wild. Kupa. Someone say, ooh. Yeah, I got this picture for you. You're welcome. It's pretty, right? Uh, here's uh, a little more um, biological picture. So what they would do is they would take this root here that almost looks like a horn, right? And some of the flowers, and they would crush it up and do stuff to make oil. Some of you are oily people. You know how they do it, but that's what they'd use, right? And so you'd take of the spike nard plant, you'd take the nard, which is the oil that's made from the root, and that's how you would get it. Um, You might ask, like, what is this from? Why is this there? It grows in the Himalayas, and it was very valuable, it was, it was particularly valuable, as what we'll see Judah says, but it was used for, I just, I spent a lot of time thinking, like, we, we imagine, okay, yeah, of course, Mary, Mary poured expensive goo on Jesus, we get it, but then it's like, why? Why did she have this? What is this thing? Like, what, is it, was it special? Is it just a Christian thing? Like, what is nard, man? Like, so I kept kind of messing with this. It turns out that it was used typically for perfumes, religious ceremonies, and medicinal purposes. And it wasn't something everyone had. This wasn't like, go to Walmart, it's probably in the little section at the beginning of Target that forces you to spend extra money because it's under a couple dollars. It's not like that. This is like, not even order on Amazon, you're special ordering this from a craftsman from the Himalayas. It's not easy to get. Um, owners likely used it for personal grooming, special occasions because it smelled good. It filled the whole house with perfume. Uh, owning spike nard was a sign of affluence and luxury. So why did she have so much? 
again, you think about later on when this is explained, like this is like a year's worth of money. Like why does she have so much of this stuff? Because I, I tend to think of these people that follow Jesus as maybe already poor and giving everything to follow him. No. Um, this family clearly had wealth, and it, it's because of the house, the party, the way they're staying at. John is wanting to pull us into this understanding that, that this family had wealth. Mary, along with Martha, Lazarus, they seem well, well off. And again, nard is pretty valuable. It was aromatic. It was a luxury item. It was uh, not something that everyone just had. I, I can't get over this house being filled with the fragrance of this perfume. It... it this might not fit anywhere else, but I think it's interesting to think through that when we worship Jesus heartfeltly, honestly, when we offer everything we have to Jesus, it's not unnoticeable to people. It fills the room one way or the other. People recognize that Jesus is special. And it should give us pause to think, if Jesus is so special to me, but no one is filled with the fragrance of how special Jesus is to me, maybe Jesus isn't that special to you. What fragrance fills other people's nose of what's so important to you? Or what stinks about your life from other people? What comes out of that? And, and I think it's so interesting that I just, again, this morning as I kept reading this, the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. John didn't have to include that detail. It was expensive and hard to write things down in this time. But as he's writing it, he wants us to know that sentence. Hey, the house was filled with it. Verse 4, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Come at me. Judas, just everyone, Judas, thumbs up or thumbs down? Bah! No one in here is like, I kind of like the guy. I hope my kids grow up to be like him. When I have a son, I hope he's just like Judas. No one in the history of Judas Iscariot has been called Judas Iscariot without being associated with something in the realm, right? You don't say, bro, sweet move. That's a real Judas thing to do. Come on, let's do it again. No one does that because the name itself brings negativity to us. We think about it. It's a problem. He's not a good guy. And, and John even quickly whispers in our ear to say like, hey, he's the one that's about to betray Jesus. More on him later. But let's, let's capture what's going on here. Judas is clearly upset. Mary just anoints Jesus. It's a party celebrating Jesus. Lazarus is there reclining fully in love and, and amazed at Jesus. Martha's serving and saying, hey, we all need to get together and serve together because it takes a village, the church. Everyone's coming together, doing this stuff. And then Mary says, man, you know what my role is? I need to make sure everyone knows how important Jesus is. I need him to know how important he is to me. I'm going to give him what is most precious, most valuable to me. And it offends Judas, or at least he's really off put by it. He's fired up. He's concerned enough to spout off rebuke about it. Let's talk about why. There's, some, there's lots of things we can talk about with this, but I want to emphasize a few. Um, Mary was wiping his feet, and typically that was done um, kind of at a beginning of a wealthy, affluent party. It, it wasn't something that was made a spectacle. Feet were dirty. I you can't quite go as far as to say they were dishonorable, but it was understood that feet were not the most honorable part of the body. They weren't super special, and when the Bible mentions feet, aside from a few different places in Scripture about feet being the source of travel, right? Feet in general are considered a lowly analogy or, or a, a smaller thing. They need cleaned. Often you'd clean your own feet. Um, I think uh, I've always been raised in the understanding that there was a lot of servants that did this. And so when we talk about Jesus in a few chapters washing the disciples' feet, oh, that, of course, sermons did that. That actually wasn't very common. Um, it took a very wealthy person to have servants that would actually do that. And even among servants, that was considered like, oh, you're, you're that kind of servant. You're, you're that kind of guy. Like, it's, it's a very, very lowly thing. Um, not, not much honor in it whatsoever. Um, as seen, if you remember, John mentioned something like this when John the Baptist was talking about Jesus in John 127. He said, Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. You start framing. Even John the Baptist thought, Man, I'm below that. This understanding of, like, this is a very lowly thing very lowly to humble yourself to be amongst people's feet. So again, Judas would be seeing this, and, and why would that fire him up? Maybe because that's not where he's at? Maybe because when other people do awesome things that are uncomfortable to us, we immediately have to poo-poo them or, or cut them down because we don't want to feel convicted or feel like we need to be lowered, anything like that? 
Also, she was uh, using her hair. Typically, uh, hair was worn up. This gets complicated, but typically hair was worn up and back as a sign of modesty and respect in uh, Israel Hebrew culture. Uh, It was also associated with woman's glory, her self-worth, and respect. Uh, If you want more on that, you can go back and read Song of Solomon and how often there's an association between oil and hair and and the intimacy in the language there. There's something meaningful and intimate happening here. We can't quite say it's sensual or sexual in nature. That's clearly not what's going on. But it's a very intimate thing for her to let down her hair in front of everybody and to be wiping Jesus' feet with it. It was a way of her saying, there's nothing that I have that is more important than Jesus. My self-worth, my identity, everything is before Jesus. More on that later. And this would have fired Judas up. Let's look at what Judas actually says, though. He's clearly fired up about something here. What does he say? He says that this is expensive. What is it? How much could this be sold for? 300 denarii, right? Right. A denarii was about a day's working wage for someone, right? So um, this is about a year's income, roughly, depending on how you're doing the calendar. So let's do how much it's worth. So minimum wage, as of January 1st, 2024, is $12.30 an hour. That's, that's what the internet says, and that can you know, somewhat fluctuate, but that's where we're at right now. That's a lot from the 75 cents that some of us got paid. So sorry about the years you were born, but nowadays, if you get a minimum wage job, you get paid for it. Quite well, actually. Uh, in fact, I remember when I was paid ten fifty at Geek Squad, and I thought I was really doing well. Like, wow, double what minimum wage used to be. Anyway, so twelve fifty now, or twelve thirty an hour. So if you do that by an eight hour day, I understand some of you are superhuman hard workers who work ten or twelve hour days. You're great. You're awesome. On average, humans work seven to eight hours a day. Millennials have really tanked the average amount of days actually work happens because we really value leisure time, and that's why you work so you can have leisure time. Go back to some of the sermons we did last year about um, how we get distracted in leisure time if you want more research on that. But you work eight hour a day, that's $98.40 an hour or a day, right? So check my math, I'm not too great at this. But if you do that times 300 days, that's $29,520. That's that's what they're making annually, $29,520, right? So then that puts them uh, roughly making $30,000 or twenty nine, dollars depending on how you do budget and how your mind works. The average household income for a year for the U.S. is $68,700. So that's average for U.S. In the Midwest, it's $66,500. In Missouri, it's $57,800. And in, specifically in Jefferson and Murray, the average up till 2023, the average annual income is, I'm sorry, I think this is 2022. Who cares? $55,300. That's the average annual income. Okay? So these are the numbers we frame what this is worth for her. Obviously, there's cultural differences. There's inflation. There's all sorts of reasons why you could argue these numbers. But it's a lot. Tens of thousands of dollars is what it's worth. So what could you buy with this? How about a new car? This is a 2024 Chevy Silverado 1500 RST. I don't know what most of those words mean, but I asked my good friend Cornbread Conrad to tell me what could you buy with $53,000? And I think this one's roughly, was it $56,000, $57,000? But if you talk to my man Conrad, he'll get you going right now for $53,080. dollars $53, I bet he'd even cut off $80 if you go buy it today. What? Yeah? Yeah. I'd pay the 80 for you. Why not? A new truck! Now, some of you are like, that's not how you do my budget. I don't got that kind of money in the bank. That's not how it works. Well, if you want to go with the lower average income or something maybe closer to those 300 days, then you could also buy a new car! You could buy this thing. This one has a more complicated name. The other one was clearly a truck. This is one of those in-between things. Connor, what is this? This is a Buick Envision! No one cares. You're like, this is not car. This is like why I did the wacky, waving, and playable. I just want us to frame how special it is someone's giving something so valuable. Everyone in the room could talk about how expensive vehicles are and how buying a new car is, is difficult and, and they're expensive and, and there's all sorts of things that go into that, right? And thank, thankfully, we have people like Conrad who, who works to help people with that and, and works for that. But these things are very expensive. This was an expensive can of oil that she was holding. (laughs) It's a very expensive can that she pours out on Jesus. And it was being poured out and wiped with her hair. Have you ever given a gift? 
that costs something like this? In the tens of thousands, 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars. Have you ever given a gift like that? Have you ever been given a gift like that? What would the circumstances, just think for a minute, we're Westerners, we really value money and income. It's a, it's a mark of our society of, of power and affluence is wealth, right? Just think for a minute. What, what would the circumstances be in which you gave a forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollar gift? What would the circumstances be in which you received such a gift? Judas's argument is this could be sold and given to the poor. He was trying to rebuke Mary with Jesus' own words and teachings. Isn't that fascinating? It's almost like he's saying, you don't love the Lord with your precious possessions and by lowering yourself and your status. That's, that's embarrassing. Get up, woman. Stop it. Gross. Go help with the poor with your money. Give it to me so we can distribute it. I, I can help with this. I'm the guy. I'm the money guy. Let me, let, me, let me have something to say about this because I'm the financial dude. I've studied all the financial things. I've been with Jesus. I'm carrying his monies. I, I can tell you how this works. John tells us what's really going on behind the scenes. We have a commentary from John, and then we have Jesus' explanation, and then we're going to land on what, we're, what we want to focus on today. Here's John's commentary. Verse 6. Judas said this not because he cared about the poor. Dang it. He's not a good guy. Shoot, who saw that coming? Well, he was actually called the devil earlier in John, so if you're reading, you, you would have seen this coming. But it's interesting. So he says, he didn't care about the poor, but because he was a, a thief. What do thieves do? They steal stuff. They steal their own stuff. Typically, I know there's like all sorts of heist movies where they're kind of stealing their own stuff, but it doesn't really count. In general, thieves are stealing things that aren't theirs. That's what it means. When we tell our kids, hey, when you take something that doesn't belong to you, you're stealing. You're a thief, right? Okay. He was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. So it's like, oh, hey, money to the poor, money for Jesus' ministry, money for Judas. That's, that's how this works. You understand? We understand this idea of skimming off the top. We understand politicians and people embezzling money, all of that, right? But it's interesting. They're just This is how John, he wants to frame it. To say, hey, by the way, he doesn't really care about the poor. He's actually trying to take it for himself. In John 6... When Jesus, uh, Peter says, Lord, we, where would we go? Why, all these people are leaving Jesus. And he says, Lord, where would we go? Jesus says, did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. Which we talk about that. Jesus defines the devil as what in John 8? The father of? Lies. So when you see the word devil, you think this is the father of lies. Someone who's using lies, treachery, thievery to twist things, to adulterate things, to create chaos and disorder. So one of you is uh, the devil. And in verse 71 in John 6, he spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Judas' words show us two things. How expensive the ointment really was. A new car, right? It's expensive stuff. How expensive this stuff was. And catch this. And how suicidal it is when our hearts don't match the worth of Jesus. Judas will eventually die at his own hands, consumed by greed. How suicidal it is when our hearts don't match the worth of Jesus. More on that in a little bit. So now Jesus responds to all this. As we're working through this, verse 7. So John gave us his commentary. Hey, by the way, this is that devil guy. Like, he's, he's a liar. He's a thief. Judas. Verse 7. Jesus says, Leave her alone! Say, leave her alone. alone. Man, can you imagine Jesus saying that to you? The guy who just raised Lazarus from the dead? Leave her alone. To his own disciple. Leave her alone. So that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you. But you do not always have me. Jesus has three reasons to leave her alone. Three reasons. Because you're not always going to have me. Because the poor you always have with you, and so that it may be kept for his burial. Let's work through those. Leave her alone because you do not always have me with you. John 1.14, John 1 in general, and John up till this point goes out of his way to make sure you know that Jesus is God. In short, here we say what? Jesus is everything. Jesus is everything. Jesus, John wants us to know. Again, John included this. John included for us to understand Jesus wanted us to know this because you will not always have me with you. The Messiah is here. God dwelling with us. That's what John 1.14 says. The Word was made flesh and dwelling amongst us full of grace and truth. The Messiah is here. Take it in. Enjoy it. 
Sit with it. Recognize this is the biggest moment in history. Judas can't see it. Judas can't see it. He, he, he completely misses Jesus' presence that he's there. Leave her alone because you won't always have me with you. Leave her alone because the poor you will always have with you. Let's, let's talk and upset some people politically and everyone can just start yelling. It'd be great. Why do we have poor people? Whose fault is it that they're poor? No one wants to speak. No one. I love it. I, I, I did this just to watch your faces. That's why. It's fine. You don't have to. Because you, you clearly know I've got notes. But, but just think, why do we have poor people? Don't you care about the poor? You see someone holding a sign. You see someone who's unsheltered. You see someone struggling. Why do we do a poor ministry at our church? Why do we have, why, why do we care about the church? Why are there poor people? And, and, and you can hear people spout out in their minds. You can hear the answers of, of is it because they're lazy? Is it because we're selfish? Is it yes? What is it? Well, it's complex. And, and Jesus here isn't clearly saying, don't worry about the poor because, you know, there, there's always poor people, so forget about it. Forget about it. Nobody... Jesus is actually quoting from Deuteronomy 15. All of his disciples who heard Jesus quote Deuteronomy a ton, they would have caught this. I didn't know this. So fascinating. Deuteronomy 15 says, as God is giving the Torah, he's talking about all these different contingencies he has for the poor, the broken, the people who are downtrodden. Uh, we used to have a, a friend used to say, man, we're all one bad car wreck and a few prescribed pills away from being impoverished and being addicted. All of us, everyone in this room, get T-boned in this nightmare of an intersection right out here. All of us, instantly. Hundreds of thousands of dollars of medical bills wrecks us. And that's not hard to acquire. I went to the ER once and it cost me $6,000 last month or last year. It's incredible. So here we have this situation. It says, the poor will always be with you. Now in Deuteronomy 15, God says, for there will never cease to be poor in the land. There will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. I have so many notes about all the ways and all the scriptures God takes care of those who are broken, poor, impoverished, unsheltered in the Old Testament. But in short, the Lord is a good father who cares about his children. And he cares about his children caring for other people. This is why we talk about generosity every stinking week and we pray about being generous because our natural posture is to not be generous. It's scarcity mentality. Take what's mine, over, uh, over put some sort of caricature on the poor, it's their fault or it's government's fault or whatever. And then hold what's mine because we've got to separate these things out. But when you say, why do we have the poor? You think, well, hold on. God knew even way back there's always going to be poor. Why? Why will the poor always be amongst you? If God's standard is generosity, us helping, why will we always have the poor? Because John reminds us that Judas is the problem. Because there's always someone who's supposed to be helping who knows the will of God, who's heard all the teachings of Jesus, who cast out demons in the name of Jesus, who potentially performed miracles with the 70 that were sent out, that's still skimming off the top. They'll always be poor amongst us because we have broken, corrupt, sinful hearts. They'll always be poor amongst us because not just the world's broken, man, because you and I are broken. Because there are people like Judas who are skimming off the top. Because sin, evil, and brokenness reigns in our hearts. Because we can all be like Judas taking care of ourselves, looking to ourselves. Genesis 6, 5, the Lord says, He saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention and thought of their heart was on evil continually. Why do we have poor? Why does God care about the poor? Why will the poor always be among us? I think Jesus isn't trying to make a commentary here exactly on the depths of poverty because the Old Testament does that quite a bit and Jesus does that quite a bit by his actions. I think Jesus is talking directly to Judas and us who can relate to Judas. Poor will always be among you because you're skimming off the top, because you're creating the problem, because you're not living generously like you're supposed to. The other reason that she's to be left alone, you always have the poor with you. That... Jesus will not always be with you. Lastly, so that she might be kept 
so she may keep this for the day of burial. Uh, The Greek gets complicated here, but it could be said, leave her alone and don't hinder her from keeping her love and wonder and joy in the face of my death. Mary's act here in this, in the Greek, as you unpack this, it's it's pretty complicated, but it's, it's worded as if this is prophetic. That, that Mary's doing something that she doesn't realize how deep and meaningful it is, but Jesus is explaining it to us, and later we'll fully understand as we read this. Mary is doing something prophetic, just like how Caiaphas prophesied even in evil, uh, evil in his heart, evil intent. Last week we talked about how Caiaphas prophesied, spoke the words of God, spoke the will of God, but it was still in the boundaries of evil and wrong. We have the same quandary here. Mary does something that she doesn't fully understand. She's she's prophesying about what's going to happen. She's communicating Jesus is king. He is God. He needs to be anointed for a special purpose. And Jesus says that special purpose that you're anointing me is what? His burial. His death. She anoints him to celebrate the life of her brother, But Jesus knows it's actually celebrating his death. Why is his death so important? We have to talk about it. We have to to talk about the gospel, the most crucial point in history. John wants us to frame this Jesus again. He is the Passover lamb. He's the final sacrifice. Jesus will die for us. As Peter said, you know, it's interesting. When we get to these portions of sermon, say, man, what what are some verses that you can just remember and memorize and hold tight to? This morning, I would encourage you to memorize 1 Peter 2.24. Jesus Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree. All of your selfishness, all of the rude things you say, all the growing postures that you're completely ignorant of that go against God, Jesus took those things on. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds, you've been healed. Peter quoting uh, Isaiah there. He's saying that you would have righteousness. Again, like we say, righteousness is a relationship word. Jesus died. He took on your sins so you could have a right relationship. We don't have to live for sin. She's celebrating that her brother's alive, Mary. Yay! You made Lazarus alive. He was dead and now he's alive. Only Jesus can do that. This is what Jesus said to Martha. We talked about this on Easter. He says, I am the resurrection and life. Do you believe this? Through Jesus we can live. We are alive in Christ. Ephesians 2 reminds us. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in sin. Leave her alone because she's anointing me for my burial. She doesn't even know the depths of what she's doing. But leave her alone because she understands how precious and important I am, even beyond. Which, this is something to you, Christian, who's known Jesus a lot of your life and following Him, there are things that you do when you follow Christ that you don't even understand. You don't even understand the depths and the ripple and what they mean. But you do them in obedience. You trust the Lord. You don't have to have all the answers. You have to trust Christ because He has all the answers. This is what we see Mary doing. Extreme humility, putting Jesus above her in every way in her heart. How suicidal it is when our hearts don't match the worth of Jesus. Mary's heart was full of wonder, and thankfulness and overflowing and lavish demonstration of affection. Judas' heart felt none of that. He valued money more than he valued Jesus. Mary loved Jesus. Judas loved money. Our hearts are meant for a right relationship with the Lord. If we let anything else consume us, then it will ultimately crush and kill us because we were meant for a right relationship with the Lord to love Him. And when we love other things, those things consume and kill us because that's not what we were created for. We were created to be in a right relationship with the Lord. As we look to close in the last five, six minutes here, I want to give a warning and an encouragement. Say warning. Warning. Say encouragement. encouragement. You guys are a lot better at saying warning. You're ready for this. You're ready for the fear. You're like, ah, encouragement, I could go either way. You know encouragement actually what the word means? It's not like like lift you up. Woohoo, your hair looks great today. You're on fleek. It actually, it's a word that of pressing in and forming. It's a word that means to build up. But when you think about building, it's not always like, you're looking good, brick. It's like, no, you're actually, you're doing the work to create these things, right? And so anyway, um, encouragements can be hard to hear sometimes. That's why the Bible used the word encouragement. That's why the Holy Spirit is connected with the word for encourager, paraclete. Ah, we can talk about that another time. But anyway, back. The warning is to not be like Judas. Ah, big surprise. <laughs> He's the bad guy. You mean I shouldn't be like Judas Iscariot, the betrayer of Jesus? Come on, man. I know. No big surprise. 
Specifically here, though, if we only knew Judas from this story and John up to this front, what would we know? That he's associated with the devil, the father of lies. He's been lied to. He's been deceived. He's not the devil himself. He's associated, because we talked about how that's never a proper noun, right? That's not what the word devil means, right? It's a descriptor, right? It means, it means diablos, adversary, uh, uh, diabolical one. And so he's associated with the diabolical one, the one who's deceiving and lying. Also that he's a thief and that he's going to betray Jesus. Why does, why does John include this? Is it just for his narrative to help us think through how Jesus comes to ruin? No. Judas represents the vast majority of humans in the Old and New Testament, a posture. Remember, Judas was chosen by Jesus. Work that out in your predestination thoughts. Like, it's, it's complicated, and that's why theology is like predestination and how God's sovereignty works. It's complicated. And if you have one sentence for it, you're probably missing it because God's too wonderful for that. But he chose Judas. He brings him in. Judas follows Jesus. Here's all of his teachings. Here's all of his teachings. Just like maybe you, growing up in church, we're all teaching Jesus. And then he goes out, casts out demons, performs miracles, heals the sick when he sent out the 70. And now he's here. He has a special role amongst the other disciples. He's, he's carrying the money. He's got some, some power and affluence amongst them. He's, he's in charge of how they get stuff. He's still looking to himself, still selfish. Genesis 3 reminds us that the crux trouble with man, every problem in your life comes down to you want to be God. You want to decide good from evil. Every problem, whether someone who's hurting you or how you're hurting other people, trying to be like God, trying to decide good from evil for yourself. This whole story echoes of Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. No one can serve two masters. He will either hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You see here, two people who have two different masters. One whose master is money, or better translation, the idea of power, affluence, and, and controlling substances that give you power and affluence, stuffs, money. And the other values Jesus. How does this relate to us? I want to land real quickly on grumbling about others because we see ourselves as above them or need to love ourselves. Why, why would we need to, why would you just need to, to push her down so quickly? She authentically loves Jesus, does this incredibly extravagant thing. Why does Judas have to knock it down so quickly? I believe it's because the opposite of creation, what we were created to do, we were created to create good things. Genesis 1 and 2. That's the image of God, create good things. The opposite of that is criticism. It makes us feel like we're creating something, but actually we're just destroying it. We're cutting it down. How often in your life do you just see something that's good and immediately have to talk down about it? Someone's doing something good, yeah, but they're a jerk. Someone wins something. Someone does something lavish. They're raising their hand in worship and singing loudly. And your first thought is, man, they sing badly. Or, oh, look at that showboat. We immediately have to cut them down. Why? Well, if you ask AI to give you some, some phrases about ways people act, you'll get words like this. And I love doing this. This is another distraction that I had. But it's so fascinating. Negative Nancy, Critical Carl, Johnny Jerk, Grumpy Gus, Sour Sally, Pessimistic Patty, Debbie Downer, Snarky Sam, Bitter Bob. I've got like 30 more if you want them. <laughs> we laugh, but is this how people know you? Are you grumpy Gus, negative Nancy, pessimistic Patty? Just always have to spit and moan about something because you can't, can't possibly lift others up because that would reveal how actually lowly you are. You can't handle being around other people. You've got to be the negative person. You've got to actually tell people how it is because you know. This is the heart we see that comes out of Judas. We can know, here's the warning, you can know all the stuff. You can follow Jesus around. You can hear his teachings. And you can completely miss it and be like a grumpy Gus or whatever and completely betray Jesus. You'd say, oh, I would never. You already did. That's why he died. Judas reminds us of, of how quickly we could be turned, how quickly things could be broken for us. Why? Because we're unwilling to lay it all down and put everything before Jesus to say, I'm going to follow you. And, and as a quick side note, how would you know if you're pessimistic Patty or Debbie Downer or, or corrupt Carl or whatever the words are? How would you know? 
Because the Bible tells us to speak truth in love. Because the Bible's not a book of heroes, but of a community, of one body being together. If you're in this room and you know somebody, you're thinking Sour Sally and you're actually thinking about someone in this room and you haven't told them, it's on you. Because this is one body. And when we tell people about our church, and we have this little gathering, we tell people what kind of church we are, I'm going to passionately tell them that we come together and we live as one body following Jesus. And that's not a lie. I do that. I have hard conversations with people. And people have hard conversations with me. And I watch it happen in our church weekly and monthly because we love each other. And so if you're sitting here and you're broken, you're going amok, or you know someone is and you're not doing anything about it, you're going directly against it, you're part of the problem, you're skimming off the top, you're just like Judas, hear it, because I'm sick of seeing it. If we love each other for one body, then we're going to lean in and we're going to live like Christ. If we're not, then pick a different hobby. Quit pretending, because Mary walks up to Jesus, gives him everything. This isn't just really expensive stuff. A new car, that's a cute analogy. She's taking everything she is, her perception of her self-worth, her value, her dignity, anything that anyone could say. Oh, Mary's got wealth. Mary's got an art. Mary. No, she puts it all before Jesus. The encouragement is to be like Mary. The encouragement is to look to Jesus because there's something that we all hold on to. There's some lie that the devil's put in all of us saying, no, 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 you've got it. This is, hold, don't let go of this. Don't really trust these people. Don't really join the church. Don't really get baptized. You don't really... There's something that we're holding on to. Mary puts it all down because she realizes that her identity, her dignity, her respect, her value, all of it is at the feet of Jesus because Jesus is everything. Because Jesus is everything. The warning this morning is to not be like Judas, and I hope that there's something that stood out to you and understand the offense. Judas isn't just some political guy that's scheming money. There's something in his heart. There's some grumbling, grumpy Gus attitude that's rippling and corrupting, and it eventually will be a part of what kills Jesus. His sin reflects all of us. But then the encouragement is to be like Mary, to open your hands, to say Jesus really is everything. What is most precious to you? What is your glory, your self-worth? How do you respond to Jesus today? As we stand, as we sing a song, don't let this just be a moment to say, okay, okay, yeah, we're on time, and now we gotta, I got to do this, I got to God brought you here for a reason. God wants you to hear something. God, God led us to preach this and, and work through this for a reason. Because God wants you to know something. What do you need to let go of? Sit with Jesus now and ask him, because he's a good father. Because, because Jesus wants to have a right relationship with you. He wants to speak to you. He wants you at his feet. Take time and talk to Jesus. Father, guide us this morning as, as we have people around to pray with, as we, as we respond, as we stand, as we sing, as we open our hands. I pray by the power of your spirit that you would, you would let your word weigh on us and that your spirit would reveal what we need to hear. And teach us all things and remind us of what Jesus said. Show us what we need to let go of. Show us what it looks like to love you lavishly, outwardly, in a way that fills the whole room, like Mary. Show us what that looks like, authentically. God, we trust you. We trust you to guide how we ought to respond. Thank you for your great love for us. Guide us now as we sit before you.